far. Because there's some roadies and then there's some azaleas. I don't know. The only flowers I knew in my childhood were the dandelion and the wild prairie rose. And I could tell you which one was which, but it's so nice. Um, years ago, decades ago, when this church was, uh, um, was planned, this section of the church was built, the, uh, the architect was a Lutheran architect who was someone who said, you know, let's find out what these Adventists want in their worship services, what they do. So that's why the baptistry is uh, kind of out toward the congregation. That's why the parents' room is right there, uh, not in a, in a far distant uh, behind glass back there. Um, and, and they said, let's have, you Adventists like nature, right? Okay, let's have, but your Adventists also do not like to be dis, uh, distracted by seeing cars going back and forth. So they put the wall up, put plantings within the wall, and that has blessed us ever since. So thank you for being here today on this beautiful day. We're going to go through the bulletin announcement section, and we are going to give, um, we're going to regretfully, and I was thinking, with this membership transfer vote, maybe we should vote it with the upraised, either an upraised implore, imploring gesture of sorrow or an upraised fist, because this is a, this is a good thing. Membership transfer is a good thing because it shows that somebody who used to belong to our congregation wants to be involved in uh, the church they've moved to, but Olivia Spady, this is the final official action which will transfer Olivia from the Bellevue SDA Church to Loma Linda University Church of SDA. Let me tell you my, uh, my little Olivia story. Consider, think about Olivia, Olivia, eight or nine. She's eight or nine. She's, it's vacation Bible school here at the church. It's one of a, it's kind of a lower, lower uh, number at vacation Bible school. She's, they're doing relay races downstairs in the children's division. And it's raining outside evidently. So she races up and down the hall. And finally, she comes and sits down beside me on the step because I was sitting on the step there. And uh, she said, Pastor, Pastor Jerk, how are you? And I says, fine. She says, no, really, how are you? I says, oh, Olivia, I'm doing fine. She says, that's not bad for an old man. <laughs> and that's, I've to, I told that story at her wedding, too. And I think she got a kick out of it. She, she, did, not, she did not say she didn't like it. Anyway, that's, a, that's the Olivia whose membership we are reluctantly relinquishing here this morning. So, okay, let's do this, this uh, dreadful deed now. Would somebody like to move that this happens? It's been mournfully moved. Somebody like to second it? It's been seconded with, a, with maybe, maybe some more encouragement in that second, which will is courage, asking courage for her, her good work down in Loma Linda. She's doing a wonderful work there as a, as a student there. So let's vote it. All those in favor? Limply raise your hand. No. Now this is a good thing. She's, uh, she's got a lot of talent and ambition and she wants to use it for the Lord. Okay, take a look at the, oh, look at this. Graduation season is coming, this little announcement, middle way down the page. If you have a graduate in your family, preschool, kindergarten, eighth, high school, college, please let either me or Kayla know. Let us both know. Send it to both of us, because what Shelley will eventually do is coordinate a graduation um, commemoration for for people. So let us both know. Please do this. Even if you think we know already, just, just double check, triple check, and send us the data. Then you see at the bottom the various graduation, uh, PSAA and KSDA graduation events there. They're coming up. May is almost done. Now I'm going to study the announcement page and see if there's anybody, or the announcement section, see if anybody's has an announcement. I guess not. So let us then move into our worship service and let's uh, be praying that the Lord will be with the Pathfinders at Sunset Lake Camp. The Pathfinders are, have a, um, an outing. 
this, uh, this uh, beautiful day. And, and finally, these pathfinders, it seems like, are getting a good, uh, good weather, which uh, will just heighten the enjoyment of their evening, uh, their uh, weekend. So let's be praying in our hearts that uh, they will be refreshed and that we will be refreshed this morning. Our kind Heavenly Father, it's easy to lift our voices in praise. Sun shines down the greenery, 
glows and the bright flowers, which testify to your utterly creative spirit, um, give us cause to praise. Help us to remember to praise you not, not only in the sunshine, but in the shadows, because our memories go back to how you've helped us in the past. Give us courage as we worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, I am not the, worship, the uh, strength for the week this morning, but I have a report from the captain of the strength for the week team, Richie Hammond. Richie has been very busy this week, and here's what he wanted me to read this to you. This is a message from Richie. I told Richie, I said, you know, Richie, you are a citizen of the new earth. And I, what I meant by that was he's somebody who's intensely interested in things and very, very dynamic, had a lot of energy. And so he's, it's a Richie, I think he's already in the new earth, you might say. And he said, uh, when I emailed him that, I, he, I, he said, yeah, he said, well, I try. He said, that's, that's the way I try to live my life. So anyway, here, this is from Richie to you as follows. Hi, church family, Richie here. This past month, I've been on a series of quests to obtain and share health knowledge. They've included participating in Bloom's Day, a 12K run in Spokane after not running in it for several years, practicing survival skills with a friend in the Cascades and having some deep conversations on what it means to trust and connect with the Creator, participating in a phenomenal practice, practical discipleship course for men in the humid hills of Tennessee, attending the first live show of Stanford University neurobiology professor Dr. Andrew Huberman of the Huberman Lab podcast on the mind-body contract, giving a three-part health seminar this weekend at a local Hispanic church. And I ask for your prayer warrior support. I can't wait to share with you some of the treasures I've captured along my adventures, and I encourage you to step outside your comfort zone and try out experiences of learning, discipline, connection, and discovery so we can all benefit each other more and more as we move forward along the path of being more like our captain, Jesus. So we wish Richie well, and uh, as he does his seminar today, so send a prayer up once in a while for that, because I assume he's doing it in Spanish, one of those tremendously bilingual people in our congregation. So that's our strength for the week. Good morning. Feliz sábado. So today's offering goes to our local church ministry. So we are so thankful that you guys are faithful on your uh, tithes and offerings. So uh, there's going to be deacons today going around, but also you can uh, give online. You still can go in with the uh, with the app or uh, through our website. You can find the link to, to donate or to give online. So could the uh, deacons please stand? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you give to us. And now we are giving you back part of uh, what you uh, uh, give us, and uh, we just hope that uh, whoever is in need, that you be uh, providing for those. Uh, use them as you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Please join us in singing. your handbook if you'd like as well. It's number 248. number 86 and I chose the song it was my dad's birthday this week and um, he had about 20 years ago had a quadruple bypass and we didn't know that he was gonna make it and he's here today and I'm very glad and this was my song then um, how great are our or how great thou art so it's my prayer of thanks <laughs> please stand to thee. 
Today, uh, scripture reader, reading is in Second Chronicles 20, verses 1 through 4. So there's a Bible right underneath your pew. If you want to follow on, it's in page 424. Second Chronicles 20. It says, It happened after that, that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon and others, with them, side the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hasson Tarmar, which is at Gedi. And uh, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast through all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So this is the time when we share our celebrations and concern to our church family. But if uh, there's someone that prefers to keep it between you and God, you can raise your hand and he'll know your need or your, or your celebration in your heart. But if you want to share it with us, there'll be a deacon going around with the mic, so you can just raise your hand and then he'll come to you. I just want to say also that uh, we are so happy that there's a couple a family here visiting, uh, visiting us from, from California, Edmund and family, so welcome. Okay, so if is there anyone? 
Nancy? Uh, thanks, uh, Miguel, to make our visitors feel welcome here. And then here is a Miguel. Miguel, stand up. Miguel, Andres Cordoba, sorry, is Andres. He's visiting us for a little bit from a Bellevue Hispanic Church. And uh, we had the pleasure to have him in our home a couple of times. And uh, we've been uh, impressed with his uh, Christian life and, and his, uh, his experience and, and make him feel welcome. Maybe one day he's going to change his membership here. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. And it's, this is very important because uh, 35 years ago, he, baby church don't make me feel welcome. Maybe I'm not here. <laughs> Thank you. We, we do miss potlucks. We do miss potlucks. Anyone else? Right here, uh, Elsa. Um, so um, my, I'd like to request continued prayers for my uncle Pablo in El Paso. Um, just an update, he didn't have, uh, the last time he did not have uh, his foot amputated, just uh, some toes. Um, my parents were able to go visit him and um, he seems to be in a very delicate uh, stage. Um, and he had a graft put in in his foot. Um, and so the prayer right now is uh, hoping that the graft will take the, and, and heal. And so uh, he, he is very thankful for our prayers um, and asks that we continue praying for him. He's a faithful servant of the Lord, and so he um, um, asks for um, the Lord to do his will in his life. So, thank you. There's just a couple things I wanted to share. One is a, a, just a note of appreciation uh, for what our children's division leaders and teachers have been doing for us for the last several months. Um, we do uh, provide a nice Sabbath school program downstairs for our children, and I want to thank the teachers who are opening their doors and welcoming one to four or five children uh, a week, and we just would encourage uh, families to have their children in, in what they would consider their church, which is Sabbath school. And I want to thank the NOMCOM for um, making sure that we have uh, staffing for next year. And I know that some, some of the same leaders have, have, are going to continue doing that. So praise the Lord for that. And um, I know there's some folks in our church family who are dealing with illness in their homes and caregiving or loss. And I just want you to know that we as a church family are lifting you up and continue to... Um, want to support in any way that we can. And I'm going to be flying back to see my mom this coming week, and I would ask your prayers while I go back there and, and give a little help and support there. Thank you so much for your prayers for my mother. Bob. I just want to thank the church for the many prayers that have been going up for our family. As you know, I lost my brother about two months ago. We went back last weekend to be with uh, the family there in Michigan, St. Joseph, Michigan, where they were living. And uh, we had a large family reunion, and it was just a pleasant time to be with them, even though we were going through a sad time with the loss of my brother, Lee who's been a pastor and a missionary for many years. He was in the General Conference as well. And uh, just a faithful servant of God. It's um, so beautiful, in a way, to know that we have a God who will save us and loves us so much. And uh, we certainly look forward to the day that we can be reunited in his kingdom.
Good morning, church. I just I want to ask for prayer for my kids. Um, and I'm kind of having a hard time to <laughs> uh, transition to be a teens and, uh, and also in a school. Because, uh, <clears throat> like you guys know, my kids were going to a uh, Christian school and then transition to go to um, public school is being a little bit tough. And because, you know, there's different believers and they don't talk about God and it's kind of hard. Please help me pray for, for him. Anyone else? Teresa? I've been helping my mom find a new place. She's in an assisted living place, but I need to move her someplace else. And I'm just praying that God has the right place for her. I visited some and we're on a waiting list and I'm just praying that God will show me the right place where she can go and I'd appreciate prayers for that. Thanks. We're almost to the end of uh, the church year. So in a couple months, we're going to have new stuff, you might say, new leaders. So let's pray for all those that are still thinking about it. We call a few people, and they're still thinking about deciding if they want to help next year. So let's pray for those also. Is that, is that it? Okay. If you could, can you please kneel with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we thank you that uh, you give us a chance to be with you uh, at least once uh, a week with our fellow uh, members and with our church family. Uh, we bring to you a couple of concerns that we have on our hearts. But before that, we uh, want to thank you and praise you for all those visitors that are here today. We are so glad that they're here today uh, joining us. Uh, we bring uh, a few uh, concerns. Uh, we bring um, uh, Carolina appreciates uh, all the teachers in Sabbath School for the Kids Division that are there. We know there are not that many, but they're still there helping us, and we appreciate them. Uh, she also is going to go visit uh, her mom. So we ask you to uh, take care of their safe and to be, uh, when she's there, to be uh, a help to her mom. Uh, Bob is thankful for the uh, trip that he had to for the uh, memorial funeral for his brother and all the family got together. So he's thankful, thankful that uh, that uh, went, went fine. Carmen is asking for prayer for the kids. We know how teenagers are at this age. So she needs help from you and, uh, and the kids also need help from you. So be with them. Uh, Teresa is uh, asking for for mom, that uh, she'll find a good place, and uh, she asked for praise, so you can uh, help her with that. We uh, also want to put our pastor in your hands for the Holy Spirit to, to be with him when he's uh, preaching to us. Uh, use them as, as you will, and uh, use our hearts and our minds to understand your, your uh, word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I don't see a lot of kids. It's okay. You're all going to be kids today, right? Okay. So, my story this morning for the children is also a story that I've learned when I was a kid. And all of you are going to learn something new today. But before that, I would like to ask um, all of you, how many of you work at the retail business? It's fun, right? 
<laughs> when I used to work at a retail, a retail business, I used to tell myself or tell my coworker, I think the government should require everybody to work in the retail business for six months and see how that feel, right? But when I was at the retail business, I love it and I hate it. Because there are, you will find the best people and you will find the not so good people. So, but as a Christian, we call ourselves Christian. How many of you here are Christian? Right? We're supposed to put our smiley faces, right? No matter how, how hard it is. And at school, when I have kids who are crying, I said, you don't want to look like me pretty soon. If you keep crying, you get old easily, right? And then he said, <clears throat> so they kind of straighten themselves. I said, mm, it's, not, it's not good to look at when you cry. But I said, when you smile, you're even prettier than you, well, you're used to be. And they love it when I say that. So I will introduce you a song in my dialect, not even in Tagalog. In my dialect, it's to the sound of when you're happy and you know, but close, close. So I don't know if I have the lyrics. I will sing it first so you will know how to pronounce it. And then you can sing with me the second time. Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> okay. Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. Kun ikaw magkurisong, malaw ay nga tulukun. Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. Okay, I will translate it to you. As a Christian, we need to smile. Because if you frown, it's not a good sight to look at. So, as a Christian, we need to smile all the time. So, I have something for you too that will come with this. Okay. Can everybody see it? Right? Okay. We'll sing it together. Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. Kun ikaw magkurisong, malaw ay nga tulukun. Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. So if I put it this way, right? It's not a good sight, right? But if I put it down, it's smiling. Can we sing it again? Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. Kun ikaw magkurisong, malaw ay nga tulukun. Christianos dapat kita magyuhum. So in Proverbs 17.22, it says, there's two um, version I have. It says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Or it says, a cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries the bones. So hopefully today, from now on, it doesn't matter what we're going through. We can still put out our happy faces, right? Thank you.
Thank you, Carolyn and uh, Wilman. I love it when songwriters take the, the familiar hymns and put arrangements to them that just kind of inspire us all over again. Thank you for doing that. Love to, love to hear that music. Love to hear that flute, Wilman. By the way, you are holding it professionally. You're holding it horizontally. Oftentimes you see flutists uh, go this way. You're holding it professionally, showing that you were well-trained. I would like to do something that I think we'd like to make as a regular, a regular um, part of, uh, for a while anyway, part of our, before, just before the sermon starts. Um, AV guys, I'm going to ask you to keep an eye on these mics because we are going to use them in about 15 seconds. I would like Miguel and Clarissa and the whole family there, the kids and young lady to their, to their right, just come on up to the front. Here's why I'm doing this. Because, number one, we don't have potlucks, which is where a lot of people get acquainted with each other. Number two, we do have the photo wall. But, uh, and you guys are on the photo wall, aren't you? Is your picture on the photo wall? It, uh, the, um, we just need to get to know people, and I'm going to plant an idea in your minds. And that idea, eventually, if we need it, is called name tags. And we're going to, so come on up here, folks. I would like to get you, to get you in front of the people so that we can. In front, all right, all right here. You know what? Why don't you come, out, come right out in front so that you will be closer to the audience. And you can, now we've got to just kind of get right out there and stand there. And I would like to find out from you folks who your name, what your name is. And then we're, after we say, I know who you guys are, but after we say, you say your name, we are going to say your name back about three times. So let me get, release a microphone cord. What's your name, young lady? Maite Munoz. Uh, who? Maite. Maite? Maite? Okay, now that's a name I'm not familiar with, but I'm going to have you say it. Maite? Maite. Kind of like Maite, is it? Okay, ready? Maite. So you meet her in the, in the foyer afterwards, and you're going to come up to her, and you're going to say what? Hi. Maite. Maite. Okay. All righty. I've got silver here. I may not <laughs> do as well as you do. Thank you, Maite. Good to have you here. I often see you folks together. And this gentleman, of course, is? Miguel. And there's some, another Miguel floating around here. There may even, are you Miguel, too, in the back row? Okay. <laughs> So, Miguel, either holding your son or not, you comes up to you in the foyer, and you are going to give a glad cry of welcome, and you're going to say what? Hi. Yeah. And you're going to say, say, and you know, Lonnie taught me this trick. Lonnie, you taught me this trick. When you want to get to know somebody's name, as you're talking with them, you say their name a couple of times as you're talking with them. So you're going to be talking, talk, who are you going to be talking with here? Miguel. Miguel. And you're going to mention Miguel's name a few times in your um, conversation with him. Okay, you're going to do that? Okay. Now we're going to find out who this young gentleman here is. What was your name? Nathan. Nathan. And you would say Nathan? Nathan? And Nathan? Nathan. Okay, little Nathan's running around, but you're going to grab a hold of Nathan's, you're going to grab a hold of this young man's hand and you're going to say hi. Very good. Very good. Okay, now this, this young lady, we've heard, you've heard you sing. Clarissa. Clarissa. And when, you, when she sings again, or even as you think back on her music, you are going to say, hi, Clarissa. And you're going to say, thank you for your music. Now this little sweetie here, who is this lady? Yeah. What? Sophia. Sophia. <laughs> Sophia is a Greek word for wisdom, by the way. So, you're, so she's a smart little gal. And so little Sophia, per, perhaps pursuing Nathan, perhaps Nathan pursuing her, perhaps running around with other kids, you're going to wave to her and say, Hi, Sophia. Hi, Sophia. And what are you going to say again? One, one more time in the conversation with her, you have, you have hi. Sophia. Okay, thank you, folks. Maite? Maite? 
Mai Tai, Mi, Mai Te, Mai Te. I'm gonna have to have you write that on a piece of paper for she me. Just sometime. got here from Mexico. Oh, you did? Yeah. Well, welcome. Bienvenidos, I think. Bienvenidos. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, folks. Okay, now you know who they are. So talk to them after church. Thanks. Thanks for humoring me in this, folks. We got. We've got to get acquainted. We've got to get acquainted. And I'm going to again plant the concept, if we need it, of name tags. And you, some of you are going to say, name tags? What do we need in tags? Well, um, and when, when we, if we do name tags, folks, here's what you do with a name tag. You take a name tag. And so, somebody, we're going to have somebody write your name on the name tag. And we're, they're not going to write it in tiny little print on line two. At the front. We're going to write your first name right across in bold Sharpie marker. So the bottom line, let's get to know each other. And we are going to do that, if I remember, every Sabbath morning with a different family from our congregation. Okay, please open your Bible to Second Chronicles chapter 17. Pathfinders are meeting out at Sunset Lake, which is why we see a, seem a bit thin this morning. Also, it's a wonderful, beautiful day, but thank you for being right here. This is another sermon in a series I've been preaching since we started our Read Through the Bible in a Year plan at the beginning of the year. Second Chronicles 17 was one of the chapters in this week's reading range, as you'll see on the announcement page in your bulletin. And uh, you, can, you can follow along with that. I would suggest that you do that. Dive into some of these passages. One way to read the Bible and make, make it fairly interesting is to read only the stories. If you're reading through this, this passage, you say, okay, where's the story? You read the story. And if you don't have time, don't read the rest of it. Just read the stories. Because it's when you read the stories that you will get an idea of how God feels about us and how God um, responds to us. Several years ago, you might have remembered uh, reading, hearing about, or maybe even reading, a book called The Prayer of Jabez. It's a 32-word prayer given by someone named Jabez. Jabez only shows up once in the Bible. And it's in First Chronicles 4, verses 9 and 10. Jabez prays a 32-word prayer to God, and the verses say that God answered him. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians and a lot of Christian merchandisers have seized on the prayer of Jabez and printed it on keychains, postcards, refrigerator magnets, greeting cards, or coffee mugs, stickers, T-shirts, a necklace pendant, little buttons you can wear on your shirt, and posters, the posters come in dusty blue, sage green, and black and white. As of yesterday, an Amazon.com search for prayer of Jabez merchandise came up with 853 items you can buy with Jabez prayer merchandise. Nowadays, as far as I can tell, the prayer of Jabez seems to be fading as a trend. I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm sure the trend was created from good motives. I mean, here was a short prayer. Someone prayed to God. God answered that prayer. But I think that anyone who seriously reads their Bibles find it pretty, finds it pretty lacking in detail. And unfortunately, since the prayer is so short, you could carry it on a necklace with you. A number of people began using it as a good luck charm, which, of course, is not how prayer works. There's nowhere in the Bible that tells us that the prayer of Jabez should be used as a model prayer or a mantra for a health and wealth gospel. Jesus gave us a model prayer and told us it was a model prayer. And for in his model prayer, Jesus prayed for mostly different things than Jabez prayed for. In fact, I believe that, Je that Jehoshaphat's experience, which is different from Jabez's, is such a gold mine that I'm going to break my sermon plan and make this a two-part series. This week, we'll look at how Jehoshaphat sets the stage for his longer prayer. And next week, we'll look at the prayer itself. And I think that knowing how to pray, pray the Jehoshaphat prayer is incredibly important. I believe that the specific steps Jehoshaphat took, we can take too. And I believe that we will know better how to pray 
for what God wants us to pray for. So let's get started. The first of all, we need to set the historical stage. The year is probably 872 BC. Jehoshaphat has just become appointed, been appointed king over Judah, taking over from his father, King Asa. Let's watch what Jehoshaphat does. Second Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1. Then Jehoshaphat, his son, Asa's son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel, the kingdom to the north. And he placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had taken. King Asa had been basically a good king, but hadn't put his full trust in the Lord and had come into some struggles with nearby nations, including the northern kingdom of Israel. So his son Jehoshaphat had to do a bit of damage control. But I think we can find our sermon point, first sermon point, out of what we've just read. Let me give it to you and see what you think. I think it makes sense. What's one way to prepare in case you eventually need to pray Jehoshaphat's prayer, which we'll find later on in chapter 20? Here comes sermon point one. Protect your blessings. Protect your blessings. What do I mean by that? I mean basic stewardship. If God has given you a steady job and a salary, make sure you take care of what you have. Be a good, faithful worker. When God created Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden, he didn't suggest that they spend all their time taking vacations and going on sightseeing tours. Instead, in Genesis 2.15, even before there was such a thing as sin, with all the hard labor it would cause for the, this couple, God put Adam and Eve in the garden to tend and keep it. In other words, take care of it. Be good stewards of it. Protect your blessings. Guard what God has given you. That means that you follow other Bible advice and live within your financial means. My dad feared and detested debt, and he passed this terror along to me. This sometimes means cutting down, cutting back, in order to make ends meet, it means resisting spending money impulsively. I grew up in a family where dad was the only breadwinner until my brother, the youngest of the family, was 11. Then mom went to work on a full, full-time full night shift at a state institution so that in the morning she could be home to get her kids off to school and then welcome them back home in the afternoon every day. That means she never quite got enough sleep, but she wanted to protect the children the Lord had given her. Protect your blessings. You know how to do this. Before you go into a store, put your valuables out of sight and lock your car. And you can tell me many other ways how to be sensible, how to protect what God has made us a steward of. We need to protect the planet as well. We need to protect our bodies from unhealthy food and drink. Someone once suggested, when you go to a grocery store, shop more of what's close to the outer walls than what's in the center section. There around the outer walls, you'll find most of the produce and natural items which are good for you. So why is it important for your prayer life that we protect God's blessings? Not only being a faith, if faithful steward is good, but it, because we, if we are a faithful steward, there will probably be less to pray for. Unexpected things happen, of course, tragic things. But if I take care of God's blessings the best I can, I normally won't have to send up as many emergency prayers about these things. But now let's move on to another way to prepare for the Jehoshaphat prayer, verses 3 and beyond. Chapter 17, verse 3. Now, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, the gods, uh, false gods, but thought, sought the God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not according to the acts of Israel. Therefore the Lord Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat, and he had riches and honor in abundance, and his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he removed the high places and wooden images from Judah. What's another way to, to prepare for the Jehoshaphat prayer? The first way to, is to protect your blessings. If, if that's the case, I believe the second way is to act out 
your dedication to God. Act out your dedication to God. Thinking back to our old friend Jabez, we don't know whether he acted out his dedication to God. All we have is his prayer. That's all we have. But we do know exactly what Jehoshaphat did. We just read about it. Jehoshaphat followed David's righteous example. He refused to even consider following the god Baal and other gods. He sought or hunted for or searched for the true God and walked in God's commandments. And in verse 6, verse six says that following God wasn't just a duty, but a delight to him. Jehoshaphat didn't just claim to be dedicated to God. He acted out that dedication. Even though Jesus' friend James wouldn't be born for nearly 900 years, Jehoshaphat followed James' advice. In James 1, 22 to 25, be ye, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, that this one will be blessed in what he does. This past Sunday, on a post-breakfast saunter, I spotted a worm on the sidewalk. When I first saw him, that worm's head was under a sort of thick, soggy, dark wad of vegetation. He was pushing his head into that pile, systematically doing his best to tunnel through it. I grabbed my phone and fumbled with the camera app, but by the time I focused on him, his head had popped through on the other side, and he was moving methodically on to other adventures. I was happy for him, but on reflection, I decided I needn't have been too worried. After all, this worm's main occupation was tunneling through dirt, and this soggy clump of organic matter barely tested his muscles. Perseverance, right? A refusal to be stopped by what must have seemed like a gigantic shrubbery thicket, right? This worm operated, as far as I can tell, by faith and not by sight, because worms don't really have eyes. They only have light and dark sensors on their body so they can tell whether they're above ground or below it. So how can I act out my dedication to God like Jehoshaphat did? Well, like him, I can refuse to be captivated by the world's idolatries. Jesus specifically called a greed for money an idolatry. Other idolatries he spoke against were pride, hard-heartedness, stubbornness, other problems. I need to ask the Savior to show me if these are a problem for me. And like Jehoshaphat, I need to walk in God's commands, not the temptations of the culture. Even the tiniest glimpse of today's media shows that they are flaunting each of God's Ten Commandments one by one, over and over again. Our culture is providing human idols for us to worship. It's using God's name carelessly. OMG, you always hear that. And it's uh, disregarding the Sabbath, of course. Dishonoring parents, glorifying murder and adultery and theft and lying. And our culture is ignoring the dangers of covetousness. And finally, Jehoshaphat took his faith far beyond duty and delighted in the Lord. Am I doing what needs to be done to be delighted about God? I do this by learning more and more about our creative, compassionate God through his word, through a fascinated study of his natural world, such as that humble but incredible worm. Well, now stay tuned for a hugely fascinating third sermon point. I never realized this was in the Jehoshaphat story before. In fact, I really hadn't devoted the attention I should have to this story. What's another way we need to prepare for the times you might need Jehoshaphat's prayer? Verse 7. Chapter 17, verse 7. And in the third year of his reign, he, Jehoshaphat, sent his leaders, Ben-Hail, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathaniel, uh, Nathaniel, and Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. 
And with them he sent Levites, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebediah, Asahel, Shemiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, and Toba, Toba Dani, Toba Donijah, the Levites, and with them Elishama and Jehoram, the priests. So they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. What's another way to prepare for Jehoshaphat's prayer? The first way is to protect your blessings. Second way is to act out your dedication to God. And I believe that the third way to prepare to pray Jehoshaphat's prayer is to support God education. Support God education. I was tempted to make this third point support Christian education. But even though Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit have always been working together since the beginning of time, even so, Jesus, the earthly Messiah, wouldn't be born for nearly 900 years. You see, Jehoshaphat knew how crucially important it was for the average person to know what, it, what was in the Bible God had provided, which is basically the first five books of Moses. When it says in verse 9 that those teachers the king sent out had the book of the law of the Lord with them, don't get the idea that it was just rules and regulations. Each of the five books of Moses and any other scriptures they might have had, like Samuel, 1 Samuel, um, they have stories too, priceless stories of how God communicated with people and invited them to follow him and be nourished by him. And that's what the people needed to hear. If nobody knew what was in the Bible, there would be little defense against a tangible wooden idol or a heathen altar of sacrifice in a high place. God's people needed God's stories. How important is this? Yesterday morning, I got a breathtakingly encouraging example of why it's so important. On Monday, Shelley and I had traveled to Coopville, where I had a part in a memorial service for longtime church member Ron Reiter. Ron had been a mountaineer. And as I was deciding what to speak on for two chapel talks I was giving at the Kirkland Seventh-day Adventist School yesterday, I decided to tell him a little about Ron. But while Ron is indeed an inspiring subject, and the kids were impressed, what really took my breath away was when I asked them if they could think of anyone in the Bible who was ever on a mountaintop. I'd written down a couple of my own answers off the top of my head. God came down on Mount Sinai. Moses had climbed that mountain. Jesus had climbed the Mount of Transfiguration and later the Mount of Olives. But when I asked the kids the question, hands flew up all over the room and I began, began to get answers I had not thought of. Noah's Ark resting on Ararat, David being chased by Saul through the mountains, Abraham taking his son up on a mountain. And suddenly I realized these young people were getting it. They had been taught the Bible stories so well that those stories were within them. In them, they knew them in fascinating detail. And that Bible education didn't happen by accident. I've known grown-ups who were never taught even the most basic details about how God created us and loves us and all he's done for us. But these kids had that education. These kids knew those same stories that Jehoshaphat wanted to have, have taught to his whole nation. And these kids in, in the school yesterday knew more stories than that. They knew the stories of Jesus because these kids were receiving a Christian education. And if, after all, if, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and if it's true, as Romans 15.4 says, that whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. If that's true, then no wonder Jehoshaphat dispatched teams of educators all over the nation. So how can we put this step into practice? How can we support God education, or as we would say today, Christian education? Well, I hope nobody ever assumes that the Bible stories are old-fashioned, or too direct or too brutal for young ears. Sure, you need to be careful which stories you tell first and put on the flannel boards. But children and the rest of us need to know these stories. Someone recently told me 
but he has a couple of grandchildren who have no Bible learning at all. The parents don't think it's important. The grandpa, this grandpa told me that one time when he visited their house, I think it was when they were having a meal, he said to his grandkids, let's have prayer. And his little granddaughter asked, what is prayer? Hurt that grandpa's heart. So make sure your kids or grandkids, as much as is possible for you, know the stories of the Bible. Bring them to Sabbath school. How else are they going to learn those stories in the company of other children taught by knowledgeable and tender-hearted teachers? Send them to our Adventist church school if you can. I had eight solid grades of Adventist elementary education, and that's where I learned Jesus' life principles he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. I memorized most of it at one point. School is where I learned those dramatic miracle stories. School is where I learned that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. School is where I learned that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. A good Bible-based edu Christian education is where your kids will learn what it really look, will look like when Jesus returns. When Jesus comes back, it will be bright and noisy and earth-shaking, but very safe for those who are ready for his return. If you don't have children or grandchildren in our schools, but you do have the money, get together with the school people and find out how best your funds could be used. Dare to be a Jehoshaphat, someone who will make as sure as possible that God's word reaches the hearts of the children and their moms and dads. And if you're longing for your own children to attend our Seventh-day Adventist schools, talk to the school itself. They have scholarship programs. Get in touch with me if you'd like more information. We might be able to help as well. Let's look at just one more way to prepare for the Jehoshaphat prayer, to pr be able to pray it. The next week, we'll pick up the story with one final way to prepare, and then we'll go through the actual prayer Jehoshaphat prayed and find out how we can use it as a model. The rest of chapter 17 mentions how richly the Lord blessed Jehoshaphat and how the nation was at peace and how even foreign kings would bring gifts to King Jehoshaphat. And now let's move to chapter 18. This is a rather strange chapter because it shows how Jehoshaphat seems to be toying with an alliance with Ahab, the king of Israel, who has been Judah's enemy from time to time. But as we go through this part of the story, we'll see that Jehoshaphat still has his firm principle. Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 1. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and in abundance, and by marriage he allied himself with Ahab, unfortunately. After some years, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him and the people who were with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth-Gilead. So Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will you go with me against Ramoth-Gilead? And he answered him, I am as you are, my people as your people. We will be with you in the war. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Up, uh, uh, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Again, we feel a little queasy about the plot here. Later on, the Lord will use a prophet to firmly rebuke Jehoshaphat for getting into this unholy alliance with the notoriously idolatrous Ahab. But as you see, Je 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 Jehoshaphat hasn't completely lost his mind. He still wants to find out whether the Lord is in agreement with this battle. King Ahab, of course, knows very well that he has 400 prophets who will prophesy exactly the way he, he pays them to. So he called them in, verse 5. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 men, and said to them, Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat still smells something fishy. He has evidently picked up on the real character of those 400 prophets. Verse 6. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. He is Micaiah, Micaiah the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. 
What I'm about to read is a delightfully intriguing and ironic story. Watch what happens, verse 8. Then the king of Israel called one of his officers and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imla, quickly. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, clothed in their robes, sat each on his throne, and they sat at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Chenaanah, uh, said, had made horns of iron for himself. He's going to do a visual aid here. And he said, thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they're destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Therefore, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that I will speak. Then he came to the king. This is funny. Uh, he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And he said, go and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. <laughs> and now Ahab gets suspicious. I don't know if there was a smirk in Micaiah's voice or an ironic twist, but Ahab knows he's kidding. Verse 15. So the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord. Then he, Micaiah, said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? The story continues. Interesting story, by the way, but let's lay down sermon point four. What's another way for me to prepare for the Jehoshaphat prayer? First way, protect your blessing. Second way, act out your dedication to God. The third way is to support, support God education somehow. And I believe that the fourth way is to prepare for the Jehoshaphat prayer is to insist on God's truth. Insist on God's truth. The story goes on and includes a rather interesting account of God's decisions to make sure that King Ahab gets the punishment he deserves. Ahab, of course, would never have come within a mile of this danger if he, like Jehoshaphat, had always insisted on God's truth. A week or so ago, I was walking in through our neighborhood and noticed that there were some trucks gathered around one of the houses. I've seen that the day or, previous day or two. I figured something was being repaired or some renovation was going on. One of the trucks was a white van, and I don't believe it had any markings on it as to which kind of repair vehicle it was. My stroll took me close to this white van. There was nobody inside, but my eye was caught by something I saw on the dashboard as I passed. It was a large, inch-thick paperback, and on the cover it said, NFP70. National Electrical Code 2020. I looked it up online, and here's what it says about this book. The National Elect Electrical Code, NEC, or NFPA 70, is a regionally adoptable standard for the safe installation of electrical wiring and equipment in the United States. It is part of the National Fire Code series, published by the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA a private trade association. For some reason, I have several blank sheets here. Here we come. Ha. And suddenly, whoever was driving this white van gained a great deal more credibility to me. I don't know this person, and I don't know what kind of experience they did have, but at least they brought along with them a source of truth, and kept it out where they could get at it if they needed it. Jehoshaphat insisted on God's truth, and I need to insist on God's truth too. You and I need to ignore any popular opinion if it disagrees with what the Bible clearly says. And we need to keep our Bibles handy in, in our study and in our minds so that we can figure out what's really true. 
Well, I believe we're almost ready to learn how to pray Jehoshaphat's prayer. We'll do that a week from today. If you'd like, go ahead and read the Bible reading range you see in the bulletin, but make sure you also study through Jehoshaphat's prayer in chapter 20. I believe it's a pattern which other people like Moses used when talking to God. And I believe that you and I need to pray like this too when the stakes are really high. But now let's express our worship to our creator in him, which is perfect for that purpose. Jehoshaphat followed this hymn's advice, even though he didn't know it. And you and I need to do it as well. It's number 83 in your hymnal, and you'll see the words behind me as you sing. So let's stand and sing number 83, O Worship the King. Worship the King, all glorious above. O oh, gratefully sing His wonderful love. Thou shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Let's pause while frail children of dust and feeble as frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and a friend our kind heavenly father thank you for being our maker defender redeemer and friend jehoshaphat knew all of this and and made sure his life and his act and his words re reflected this thank you for his example to us thank you for the courage we can take into this week ahead as we think about um, our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.